Now, we started with a handout last week, and if you didn't get that one, there are extras back there, so grab one on the way out, or just ask one of the young men. Just tell them that you need an extra one, and I appreciate you young men working hard for us. And we're talking about the doctrine of the inspiration of the Scriptures, and we've talked about how doctrine matters, and it's very important, and then uh, the doctrine of the Bible is the primary one. And I use Matthew 1.1 1, 1, where it says, The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. You'll notice that's the verse at the top of your page there. I want you to know that in the Bible, in the New Testament, the first word in the Bible is Bible. Now, we don't speak Greek, but that's the word in the Greek. It's biblios, right? That's the word. When it says in Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, the book, that word is Bible. So the most important thing to understand is the Bible, because that is where we get our doctrine from. It is not necessarily our tradition, although not all tradition is bad, but many times tradition is bad because we've just always done the same thing. That's not how we do it. We do it according to the Bible. The only thing that we can understand about salvation is according to God's Word, the Bible. The way that we know we ought to live and treat each other should be through the Bible. The way that we know we ought to raise our family should be through the Bible. So this is the standard for everything in our life. And we can take it by faith that the Bible is God's Word. Now, as I talked about last week, when people say, yeah, but the Bible's been changed, you can say, amen, it has. There are many false versions out there. There is a conspiracy to change God's Word. And that's a great conversation starter to teach somebody about the truth about the preserved text, the traditional text, sometimes often called or m the majority text, the TR, the Textus Receptus, if you're speaking in English, the only Bible that fits that standard is the King James Bible. So God has preserved His Word in English for us through the King James Bible. So we're talking about the doctrine of the inspiration of Scriptures. And if you'll notice under that header there, it says verbal plenary inspiration. And we're going to talk about those three words, two words, three words today, uh, in explanation of what that means. Our key verse for this morning is 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 16. If you'll notice what it says, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Let's open up with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I love you so much. And Lord, I love your word. I pray that you would use this time this morning to wake us up and fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we can learn more about you. Lord, my prayer is all those that would hear this would leave with more confidence that you have truly given us every word that we need. And Lord, thank you for the word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If I could get a couple volunteers uh, for an illustration, let me see if I could get, can I get some, I want to get some brothers, let me get Justice and Pax, can I get you guys, maybe I'll save you guys for the, you, you guys are quick, um, Justice, uh, Pax, if I could get you over here, sir, right about, tell you what, stand right about there, and then Pax, or Justice, I'm sorry, if you'll come over here, thank you, sir, appreciate it, all right. He's, he's always got some humor. <laughs> I, I should have given you more clear instructions. You see how it's important to have clear instructions of what we're going to do? Now, again, the verse for this morning, this thought, this theme is all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Inspiration, as we talked last week, means God breathed. God literally breathed into His Word. It, was, it came out of His mouth. It came out of His heart, out of His mind. And God breathed the Scriptures for us so that we can know them and understand understand them. And we got a few more folks coming in if we can get the ushers to make sure that they get a handout as well. And I've got something for you, sir. Pax, this one's for you. And I'll give you, I'll give you the little one so you don't break it, okay? <laughs> and I've got one for you, sir. Thank you, Justice. So we're going to talk about what is inspiration. How does it work? Now, God spoke to his people, whether through in the Spirit or audible, he gave them the words and he spoke through his people and then it was written down. Many times people will confuse the concept of inspiration, which is to speak, 
and preservation, which is to write. Some people were told specifically what to write, and you could say that God inspired the very words that they were writing down. But inspiration carries that thought of the breath coming out of God, just like in the Garden of Eden when He breathed into them and made them a living soul, just like after His resurrection on the very same day in John 20, it says He breathed in them and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit started the very day that Jesus rose from the grave. If I could breathe some scripture for you. Don't, don't, don't look. Don't cheat, Pax. This is what I would like you to write down without him seeing. And then I want you to read it as loud as you can. Yes, sir. You need me to read it for you again? Or write it show you again? Ooh, okay. All right. this on? Okay, and what I'm trying to share with you and teach you is the difference between inspiration and preservation. Hello, hello, hello? Maybe not. That's all right. Oh, there it is. Nope, here, we'll just use this one. Karis, thank you, ma'am. All right. If you would, without sharing that, don't let him look at it, please. Read it as loud as you can, sir. No justice, no peace. Thank you, Justice. Thank you, Justice. All right, sir, if you would go ahead and write that down for us. No justice, no peace. Amen. All right. We're looking at how all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and then God preserved it. Now, we'll be talking about preservation next week. Our focus this week is on the inspiration, the breathing that God said. All right, if you can read this for me, one, go ahead and turn it around and let everybody see it without Pax seeing it. Read it as loud as you can. No justice, no peace. All right, if you would turn yours around and then read it as loud as you can also. Show everybody what you wrote. Read it as loud as you can. No justice, no peace. All right, now did they say the same thing? No. Wait, wait a minute, what? Y'all got some hearing problems. You've been using too many Q-tips. You need a Q-tip. No, don't use a Q-tip. I'm confused. I forget what they say these days, right? All right. What's going on here? How come you guys have something different? You guys show each other what's going on. Show your brother what you wrote. Show your brother what you wrote. Oh, wait a minute. Now, this is what you call a translator error. All right? You guys can sit down. Thank you, Pax. You did a fantastic job. Thank you for letting me embarrass you. You always take it well. And I didn't really embarrass you. He's a lot harder to embarrass. So that's why I always pick on him. So, so what I'm just trying to show you here is give you this thought that sometimes men, human beings, make mistakes either in repeating things or in copying things down. But God is eternal, and His words are eternal, and His message is forever, and He's made promises. And He's telling us it is inspired, it is God-breathed, and He's making a guarantee with it that He's going to keep it as well. So if you'll notice on your sheet of paper there, it says, the words, the words. Uh, we're talking about verbal inspiration. God breathed, and this is important, every single word. We're going to break down verbal Plenary inspiration. Verbal means every single detail, every single word. Now, last week I used the example how to spot a, a fake Bible in Genesis 1 1, where in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. It's not the heavens, plural, as the NIV puts, or the NKJV, or the ESV, or the NLT, or the RSV. I mean, just you can name them right on down the line. They all mess that up. And it's false. God didn't create the other heavens until the second day. It was on the fourth day that he talks about putting the birds in the open firmament of heaven. He created one heaven on the first day where he would put his throne and the angels. And he created one earth on that day where he would put humankind. So this is important. Every word really matters. Every single word has authority and also importance. We believe in an every word Bible, and this is important. If you notice in Matthew 4, 4, it's on your sheet there. It says, but he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by 
bread alone, but by every word that precedeth out of the mouth of God. Jesus quoting this, and he's re referencing back, what is it, is Isaiah 8, I think. Uh, he's referencing back saying, we live by every word. We need every word. What's interesting about that, in Luke 4.4, 4, that quotes this same verse, they leave off every word of God. They get that from the critical text, from the minority text, from Codex Sinaiticus, Codex Vaticanus. We'll get into all that soon. You don't need that today. But I'm just giving you some breadcrumbs of where we're going. Luke 4.4 4 is missing a very essential part, the second half of the verse. It literally stops, man shall not live by bread alone. And it stops right there. Well, that's absurd. It says, but by every word of God. We need God's words, His living word, so that we can have eternal life. That's the message. Proverbs 3 verses 5 and 6, it says, every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not to his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. There are many men throughout history that have added to his words. John Nelson Darby wrote his own translation, and he messed it all up. Right? Uh, Webster changed the Bible, wrote his own translation. Joseph Smith wrote his own translation, the, J the JST. I have one, a copy of one of those. Um, a man named Blanco that, worked, that was in the Seventh-day Adventist wrote his own translation, the Clear Word Bible. We'll talk about some of the Bibles that intentionally manipulate and take away Westcott and Hort. Continuing, Exodus 24, look at verse number, verse number 4. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord, rose up early in the morning, and built an altar under the hill and the twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. Again, every word, all the words. You're seeing the pattern here. Now look at the next one. This is important because it's teaching us something supernatural. That means outside of nature, something only God can do. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 13, it says, Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Sometimes when you hear what God says in the Bible, it just, boy, it, it smacks you right. I mean, you're like, this is for me. This is profound. This is better than anything I've ever heard from a man. Because I'm hearing it from the Lord, from His Word. His words are spiritual, they're supernatural, and the Holy Ghost wants to teach you spiritual things from His Word. We know that we have a word-for-word -word translation, that God gave the words that were written down. He gave every word really does matter. There are many examples I could give. Brother Doug's not here, so I'll pick on him. Um, he was telling us how, what did he say? He, he told, I, I won't say which one of his children. I probably already gave it away. He told one of his children, um, go, what did he say? He said, go inside and see if my flashlight is sitting on my dresser. And he did. He went inside and looked and there's the flashlight and came back and said, yes. <laughs> and he's like, under the vehicle, like, go, go, give, give, give me the flash. Like, go get the flash. I mean, every word really does matter. And you wouldn't want to lose words because then you lose the intent, right? So uh, uh, I'm sure Brother Doug would get me for that. I think, it, I think that's how the story went. But you get the idea. If you leave out key words, it really can kind of confuse things and leave the message only halfway there. So God is very serious about his word. Notice the next point here. It says, all the words came from God's mind or mouth. Now, I know we have some accounts of some people that are unsaved in here, and we're going to get to that. But God chose what's in here. And when God gives us his word, he says, this is my mind. This is my mouth. These are my words. This is what I want you to have. That's what he's trying to say. Uh, they came from, it's almost like a direct dictation as when I showed, when I told justice what to say. He did it right. Pax heard and copied, and there was an error. Not to pick on you, buddy. Thank you for your help. 2 Peter 2, look at this, or 2 Peter 1, look at it. 2 Peter chapter 1 right there, it says, verse number 21, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. Justice did not decide what he was going to write, did he? No, no, he was told. It was dictated. It was the will of God. It was the mind of God, if you will, right? It came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved 
by the Holy Ghost. Uh, these men were God-led. They were influenced. They were separated. They were holy, which means sanctified, set apart for a holy reason so God could use them. Uh, God can't use a clean vessel and a dirty vessel the same way. God can use a dirty vessel. Of course, he can do anything. I, I could have picked one of the dirty cups to drink out of this morning, but I chose the clean one, as, as far as I can tell. It's got some fingerprints, but we're good, right? God wants a clean vessel. He wants holy men of God to speak through. Now, God still speaks through us. I believe that, but not like he did with the scriptures. You're not writing down scriptures in the same way. He's finished his perfect holy word. It's verbal, plenary, inspiration. God breathed through men that chose to be holy. God led. Now, in Acts 1, 16, this is a cool verse. It's the next one on the list here. Acts 1, verse 16, it says, Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost, by the mouth of David, spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. Now, you notice the underlying part there. The Holy Ghost, by the mouth of David, spake. So what's he teaching us? That when David was writing the Psalms, that God was talking through David. That's breathed, that's inspiration, that's verbal. But what's really cool about this particular verse, who, now Bible quiz time, who wrote the book of Acts? Who knows off the top of their head? Luke. Amen. Thank you, Elijah. Luke wrote it. Who is speaking in this particular account here? You can guess. It's okay to be wrong. Peter. Luke wrote what Peter was saying about what David wrote. You follow the lineage here. Now what's interesting, David would have written it in Hebrew and said it in Hebrew. Peter was probably speaking Aramaic or Syriac, Aramaic probably. And it's written down in Greek. We're reading it in English. Wow, now this is fascinating. What, uh, and he's talking about Judas, and then he would go on down in verse 20 where he's going to quote the actual scripture. So that's a translation in progress. It was inspired by God. First of all, it was inspired in David. When God spoke to David, that's when it was inspired. But also because we believe in a word-for-word -word translation, God was also using... Peter, as he spoke this thing about what the Holy Ghost was leading them to understand that that was a psalm, I believe it's Psalm 69, about the fall of Judas prior to Judas even existing. What a fantastic prophecy. What an interesting scripture. But this is teaching us about the verbal inspiration of God, how God speaks his word to his men. God decided what words would remain in the Bible that we read today. This is important. Acts 4, there are several of these in Acts, but we'll just, I just put one other in Acts. Acts 4, verse 25, Who by the mouth of thy servant David hath said, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? In the next great verse there, 2 Samuel 23, verse 2, it says, The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and His word was in my tongue. Luke 1, 70, it says, As He spake by the mouth of His holy prophets, which have been since the world began. Psalm 68, 11, The Lord gave the word. Great was the company of those that published it. How cool is that? God gave his word. God spoke his word. God used men through his spirit. Isaiah 51, it says, And I have put my words, plural, in thy mouth. I, I just, I, I want to drive this home. The details really do matter. We take it by faith that we have the whole Bible. We believe that God has providentially provided everything that we need. Even the things we don't understand, we take it by faith. And we trust that the Lord will lead us and guide us into all truth. That's why he gives us the Holy Spirit. You have no need that any man teach you. He says, why? Because, well, I've got the Holy Scriptures and I've got the Holy Spirit. And even if there's something you don't quite understand, uh, Brother Ross has been stirring up some controversy, whether or not Adam had a belly button. Whoa, I mean, he's talking about starting a fight. Because, you know, if you go this way, it means one thing. If you go that way, it could mean another thing. This is a big deal. Or is it? Now, wait a minute. If God thought it was a big deal, he'd probably put it in there. 
And so he's allowed to have his opinion, even if it's wrong. <laughs> but we know if it was said in the Word of God and he was wrong, we'd have a problem, right? So he's, he's trying to twist everybody over to his side. So watch him if he starts talking about belly buttons. All I know is if Adam had a belly button, he probably wouldn't have called it a button, right? Anyway, all right, let's move on. <laughs> Flip the page. If you'll get on the back side there. Uh, now we're going to talk about plenary. Plenary, the word. And so first it was the words. That's verbal, every word. Now it's about the specifics, the word, plenary inspiration. God authored the complete book. And that's what plenary means, is complete. It means full, complete. It's satisfied what it needs. It's not just similar thoughts. It is word for Word. This is what the Bible teaches us. My first example I give there is Jeremiah 30, verse 2. Thus speaketh the Lord God of Israel, write thee all the words that I have spoken unto thee in a book. Jeremiah was commanded, write it all in a book. And then what happened? Somebody destroyed it. And he said, write it all again. Now, wait a minute. Well, could Jeremiah remember? He doesn't have to because God was breathing it. And God gave all the words. And Jeremiah did keep it all. And he put it all back in there. God has great power. Notice my definition here. The word plenary literally means complete or entire. So plenary inspiration indicates that the entire Bible is holy, God-breathed Scripture. And listen, we trust His selection. There are people that will try to cause you to doubt. Yeah, what about the Gospel of Thomas? Not Scripture. Not inspired. It doesn't claim to be inspired has contradictions. Actually, it has some weird stuff in it. Well, what about the book of Enoch? I hear that one the most. I say, which one? There's three of them from different times and different authors. And they say the giants were 450 feet tall. I got a hard, I got a hard time believing that one. Matthew 5, verse 18, look what Jesus says. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot, or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. He's saying the minor details have been kept. Now, there are many books that the Bible references that we don't have. Um, the, the book of King Solomon, and there are certain books, Jasher, there are certain books, and the, you know, people say, what about the, Enoch? It doesn't say anything about a book of Enoch. It just has the prophecy of Enoch, which was verbally handed down um, God inspired that and put it in the, in the New Testament, interestingly enough. There are many books that are sort of referenced that God decided should pass away, that did not need to be here, which means we don't need it. We don't necessarily need a complete history account of all the kings and all their children and all their events, but the ones that he did want us to have, we do have, and it is accurate history. It's better than the world's history because theirs is skewed. I, the fake news, I mean, it existed 5,000 years ago. I believe that, right? Continuing, look what he says in verse, Ephesians 6, verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. He's trying to tell you something. This is your sword. Just trust the sword. Instead of saying, I don't know. Is this really the, what I should use? Man, once you get it, get a hold of it and use it. And don't be afraid of it. Too many times people are trying to defend the King James Bible. And they just, it's a lion. You just need to unleash it. It's a shield. You just stand behind it. It's your sword. Just get it in your heart. And so God can use it so the Holy Spirit can speak through you. Use the sword that you have. And listen, if you have one of those NIVs, man, you've got a wet noodle. You've got, you got the new King James. You've got a butter knife. I'm telling you, pick up the sword that's not missing any verses. This, is, this has the inspired words of God inside of it. I can hold God's very words. That's verbal, plenary inspiration. Psalm 119, verse 89, it says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. It's finished. He knows what he wanted to write from the beginning. You think God was trying to figure it out as he goes? I mean, if I asked you to write me a story or write me a letter, most of us probably wouldn't know how we're going to end it. How, how, how am I going to land the plane? How am I going to end my letter, my book, my conversation? God already knew. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning to the end. He saw all things in, in advance. He knew whether you would trust in him or not. He didn't force you to trust in him. He knows your heart. He knows the future. He created time. We're bound by time. He's outside of time. He is eternal. 
Now look, he says, the words of God are accurate. Check that out. The words of God are accurate. So we can trust them. We have the full collection from science to salvation. It's all good for us. Even the incorrect words of Bible characters are given to us to teach doctrine. Mary is the first one that comes to mind. Peter's done it. And Paul said, th Mary said, what is it, Luke 2? Or is it at the end of Luke 1? Uh, your, 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 uh, uh, your, your father and I were looking for you? No, I've been about my father's business. Well, what she said is incorrect, yes. And God chose to inspire it, put it in the Bible and keep it there. So we can say, oh, that's right. So we can point back and say that Joseph is not the father. So sometimes in our Bible, it records the error of the lost or the unsaved or even a foolish Christian, somebody walking in the flesh. It, keep, it, it retains things that people say that is not necessarily uh, Bible truth. But it's in there for a truth because all Scripture is profitable for doctrine. We can learn doctrine from the error of a human being's word. That's important. The verbal, plenary inspiration of the Bible points to inerrancy and infallibility. This is awesome. I, I could do a whole session on each of these, but I'm not. I just want to keep it simple. Uh, inerrant means without error. Infallible, without failure. Uh, notice what I put below it. It says, the God-breathed and completely authorized scriptures are perfect and powerful. That's what it means. They're perfect and and powerful. The examples that I give, uh, the doctrine of inerrancy of the Bible means without error or fault. It is 100% true. Uh, listen, I have faith that the, con the contradictions can be debunked. Years ago, I took that atheist.com challenge. Oh, there's 400 contradictions in the Bible. By the time you really get down to it, you had about half a dozen difficult passages that you need to study it out and find out. One of the funniest ones, well, here it says this guy had like 60 sons, but over here it says he had 67. Yeah, and this one was written first, and he had another son, and this was written later. You know, there are many examples like that that are easy to be debunked. And even if you can't debunk it right off the bat, you need to understand that even the misunderstandings, I take it by faith. All I know is, is God is perfect, and he promised his word, and he breathed into it. And if I don't have the answer for you, I know the answer's out there. I do. I, I take it by faith that God gives us. His word, because listen, you'll never be able to satisfy every scholar out there. You won't. You can't satisfy every scholar. Uh, the, the verse I use, Psalm 19, 7, and we sing this. Uh, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The doctrine of infallibility of the Bible. It is incapable of error, and it cannot fail. God's words are powerful. They cannot fail fail. Isaiah 55, 11, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. The Bible has just amazing scientific accuracy. It really does. And there are so many prophecy proofs. God's word is the most powerful thing. And let me encourage you in this. Uh, you, you can't convince an atheist that there is a God just by pointing to a Coke can and saying somebody had to make it. But sometimes when you preach the word of God to them, you give them a verse. And you say, all I know is the Bible says in the beginning God created. And I have faith in that. And you believe the textbook that says we think billions and billions of years ago a rock rained on, and then it turned into slime, and then it turned into an amoeba, a single cell, and then it turned into a worm and a fish. And that's what you have faith in that. I have faith that in the beginning God created. So you have faith in your God. I have faith in mine. You have faith in your book. I have faith in mine. The scripture is the most powerful thing. It's what they need the most. His word will not return void. It will accomplish what he sent it to do. It has great power. Finally, I, I thought it was necessary to deal with this. What is wrong with double inspiration, the double inspiration theory? Who's heard about this? Who knows what I'm talking about? Some of you. The double inspiration theory, some people will call it Ruckmanism after Peter Ruckman. Um, and listen, there are some very zealous King James only folks out there that sometimes take things too far. The double inspiration theory if you'll notice my comments down below, now, did God breathe through the King James Translators Committee? 
did, and I forget all the names of the guy, Lancelot, wasn't he one of them? Was his words on par with Moses and Paul and David? No, not necessarily. And here's the error. The double inspiration theory is taking away from the preservation fact. God providentially used the translators, but he did not breathe into the translators. That's why I gave this example earlier. The word was breathed into justice, and he said the word that was given to him. And a translator copied it to the best of their ability. And i got to tell you, there were, some, there were some flaws in the 1611. Some people go, oh, 1611, 1611. It's like, you don't know the difference. Uh, by the way, walls was spelled W-A-L-L-E-S. That's a change. Now it just says W-A-L-L-S. That's a change. Did the, word, did the essence change? No. Did the meaning change? No, of course. Were there spelling and typesetting changes? Yes. God preserved his word through the process, but people make mistakes. I don't believe in the double inspiration theory. I think some people are overzealous on this concept. The double inspiration, look what it says, teaches that the KJB is superior to the original manuscripts. I would say it's superior to some of the Greek manuscripts, but not the originals. There are some that are flawed and with, literally with holes in them and things erased. It's better than those because things have been erased and changed. Double inspiration confuses God breathed with God preserved. And I have to tell you, God can use an unsaved person to say something or write something down, can't he? Does every printing press have to be saved? We don't have printers like that. I mean, I ordered a book, and I was given this example last week. I ordered a book on a Friday afternoon, Saturday morning. It's at my house, and it said printed in Orlando, and it had the date of the day I ordered it. I mean, I don't even think a human being probably looked at it or touched it. It was all robots. Shock. I want to shock you with this fact. Look what it says. Some of the KJV translators were not saved. But I thought they were all inspired by God. They were not inspired. God's words are inspired. Yes. But God preserves through translation. God can use fools and unsaved people. And some good translations have errors because of man's failures and man's shortcomings. Finally, this is the introduction to next week, what we're going to talk about next week. The doctrine of preservation teaches that God kept his word pure in the King James Bible. If you speak English, it is the only Bible without the known errors and flaws. God did providentially use the specific translators to preserve his word and to help forge the English language into the primary language of world communication. The, the language of the world, the trade language, the default global language, that's English. Now, the Anglos and the Saxons were English, and we speak English, and it took time for that language to develop and change and become what it is today. The spellings have changed, the enunciation has changed, and some words have kind of fell out of use, and new words have arrived. Dinosaur wasn't, what, 1869, so you're not going to see it in the Bible, but the Bible uses dragon. We all know what that is, right? A big lizard, a terrible lizard. Oh, yeah, that's the dragon that the Bible speaks about. Dinosaur, that came on later. We don't need to change it to put dinosaur. I think dragon's good enough. But all those that have endeavored to change it, inevitably, so far, have completely butchered it and used the wrong text that has the wrong motivation from the wrong source and they leave out major doctrine. So that's it for this morning. Next week we'll be talking about the doctrine of preservation. I hope this firms you up on the doctrine of inspiration, the verbal plenary inspiration of the Bible. Let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I love you so much. And Lord, I do love your word. I pray that you would strengthen our faith in you. And Lord, thank you for giving us a perfect word. Lord, I just pray that this morning you would help us to encourage those that come and be a blessing. And Lord, help us to sing to you as we praise you, I love you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you are dismissed till the 11 o'clock.